Good morning, New Brunswick, and welcome to the New Brunswick Today Show for Wednesday, October the 5th. I'm Charlie Craddeville, and I'll be your host today. We're coming at you live from our studio here in downtown New Brunswick, New Jersey, and we want to thank you for joining us today. We've got a really great show for you. Our special guest is Brent Sonic Schmelz, a uh, Republican nominee for U.S. Congress right here in New Brunswick. He's going to tell us why he's running, how he thinks he can beat 28-year incumbent Frank Pallone, and what he hopes to accomplish if the voters send him to Washington. But first, the weather. Today it's 56 degrees and very sunny in the Hub City. It's supposed to stay sunny throughout the day. The high is predicted to be 67 degrees and the low tonight will be 49. Some traffic advisories for you today. Somerset Street is closed between Harvey and Lewis Streets until 5 p.m. Lewis Street reduced to one lane between French and Hamilton Streets heading in the direction of St. Peter's Hospital until 4. Uh, Longfield Road reduced to a single lane from Tuthill Road to Tunison Road, and uh, that's until 4 p.m. as well. And also Hale Street's going to be reduced to a single lane at Troop Avenue until 5 p.m. Now, to all of you out there watching this broadcast live on the New Brunswick Today Facebook page, please do us a favor. Share this video right now with your friends. Uh, we've got a great guest today. We want you to hear what he has to say. You can also comment on the video with your questions and feedback, and uh, we always love hearing from our readers and our viewers. Uh, our Twitter account is at NB underscore today. And uh, you can also watch this video later today on YouTube as well as on the New Brunswick Today dot com website. Today we only have one story for you, the election. And we're not here to talk about president or vice president, two offices that are actually not directly elected by the people. This year, every voter in the United States is going to get to vote on who should represent them in Congress. Our guest is hoping the voters here in New Brunswick and elsewhere in Congressional District 6, or CD6 as we call it, will pick him. Now, we can't talk about this election here in CD6 without talking about Frank Pallone, our guest's opponent. Uh, Mr. Pallone's going to be on our show, actually, Friday at 9 a.m., and he's been in Congress since I was a little kid. Seriously, after serving on the Long Branch City Council and in the New Jersey State Senate, Pallone was first elected to federal office in 1988, when I was just three years old. So for those keeping score at home, he's been in office for almost 28 years now, and he's seeking another two-year term in this year's race. Now, challenger Brent Sonic Schmelz thinks that's just too long. Uh, quote, there are lots of Congress people doing a wonderful job over a longer period of time, but too many have been there for too long, Sonic Schmelz told Politicker NJ. He also told the media outlet he would support term limits for federal officials. Ten years and you're out was his proposed policy, according to Max Pizarro. Now, Sonic Schmelz has some things in common with Pallone. They both hail from the Monmouth County side of CD6. They are both uh, have JDs. They're both lawyers. They both went to Middlebury College in Vermont for their undergraduate studies. But Sonic Schmelz also has taken a different path in some ways. Uh, he's an entrepreneur. He runs a family business, a chain of soccer stores that's all over the country called Soccer Post. You might know some of their stores. They have more here in New Jersey than in any other state. They got locations in Brick, in Deptford, in East Brunswick, right near here, Eatontown, Franklin Lakes, Morristown, Montclair, and Pennington. Now, Sonic Schmelz has never served on a city council or in a state legislature like Pallone did before going to federal office. But in 2014, he was elected to the Board of Education for a small school district in Monmouth County, Atlantic Highlands. He currently serves as the vice president of that board. Now, like I said, he feels Frank Pallone is out of touch with the voters here in CD6, that he's just too far entrenched in the establishment to do the work of the people. But some folks, especially here in New Brunswick, a Democrat stronghold, feel like Pallone must be doing something right if he keeps getting elected. But it's actually not that simple, and there's a simple reason for that. Uh, the, the reason that might explain Congressman Pallone's repeated electoral success it's called gerrymandering. Now, gerrymandering is the act of manipulating district boundaries to produce a specific political advantage, usually the protection of incumbents based on voting patterns or trends across different communities. And all you need to do to understand how gerrymandering affects us here in Central Jersey is to read one of the first articles we ever wrote 
at NewBrunswickToday.com. This is from back in 2011, the article you're seeing now. Um, you, you can see every 10 years, states have to decide where to draw the lines between each congressional district. New Jersey has 12 of them, so the state has to be carved up into 12 different uh, regions or districts. Now, that's how Frank Pallone became New Brunswick's congressman in the first place, after redistricting shifted him from the 3rd district to the 6th district. Now, the redistricting Redistricting, redistricting process is supposed to ensure that voters have real choices in their elections. But the reality is that in New Jersey, the redistricting process is highly partisan. And it usually results in most of those districts having what are called safe seats, where people can expect to stay in office so long as they stay with their party. So under New Jersey law, the commission that decides on those district boundaries must consist of 13 members and only one of those members is supposedly independent. The other 12 represent their political party, uh, six each from the two major parties, Democrats and Republicans. And the result is predictably a lot of safe seats and a lack of competitive elections. Now, most of the districts adopted in that uh, most recent redistricting lean towards one party or the, over, uh, or the other at least enough to ensure that most incumbents will stay in office as long as they keep running. So here in CD6, it's the Democrats that have a big advantage in terms of registered voters. There's just more Democrats than Republicans in the district. Now that means that barring any major changes in voters' party affiliations, whoever's running as a Democrat has a better shot at winning than whoever the Republican is on the ballot. And let's take a look at what this district looks like. If you look at that article again, you see CD6 is uh, oddly shaped. It runs along the coastline, mostly in a very thin strip through much of Monmouth County. It balloons out to include Hazlitt and Marlboro, but then it gets really thin again before ballooning once again to encompass a sizable portion of Middlesex County. It's the Amboys, Edison, Woodbridge, Piscataway, and of course, the hub city right here in New Brunswick. Now, after that latest redistricting happened in 2011, New Brunswick now sits at the very western edge of that 6th district uh, portion of Franklin Township and uh, Plainfield, another Democratic stronghold, were moved to the 12th district, uh, which is uh, represented by New Jersey's only congresswoman, Bonnie Watson Coleman. Now, some say that that plan was a significant improvement over the old districts, uh, but uh, you know, large portions of the state have clearly been subject to gerrymandering uh, that has, at the very least, been preserved in this current map. Now, that doesn't mean it's impossible to win if you're in the minority party. In 2010, Pallone seemed like he might be vulnerable to a challenge from Anna Little. Now, remember, that was the year that the so-called Tea Party movement was getting a lot of folks involved on the Republican side of things and getting a lot of attention and getting a lot of people elected. But even in that climate, Pallone prevailed over Little by a 3-2 margin, bringing in almost 60% of the votes cast in 2010. He went on to defeat the same challenger, Anna Little, in 2012. And in 2014, he kept his seat once again by defeating Anthony Wilkerson from Old Bridge with similarly dominant numbers. Now, in a presidential election year, things can be a little more unpredictable, but voters across the country need to keep in mind that there's more at stake than just that one race, the presidential election. Now, my guest today is going to tell us how he hopes to get enough voters involved here in CD6 to defeat the longstanding incumbent, Frank Pallone, despite the deck being stacked against him. We'll ask him why he's running how he thinks he can pull off this epic upset, and what he hopes to accomplish if the voters choose him. But first, something unique about our guest today. If uh, Mr. Sonic Schmeltz looks familiar to you, it might have nothing to do with politics. He was actually a contestant on the game show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, back in 2010. So while we bring him into the studio, please enjoy this clip from that fateful day. Uh, and we'll be right back with our special guest, Mr. Brent Sonic Schmeltz. Did you know that? Uh, I watch a lot of Discovery Channel. Ah, uh, okay. Well, that, boy, did that come in handy. Yep. Uh, yeah. I want you to look down and see what you're playing for. Hundred. A hundred. A hundred. A hundred thousand dollars. What was the result of the famous Civil War battle between the two ironclad ships, the Monitor and the Merrimack? Monitor sunk Merrimack, Merrimack sunk Monitor, neither ship sank, 
both ships sank. I think it's I think it's both ships sank, but I'll ask the expert just to sure. All right, let's bring in Terry Moran. Hey Terry. Hello. Are you a, a civil war buff by any chance? A little bit. A little bit? Living in Washington, D.C., you get to go to the battlefield, so I know a little bit about it. Okay, great. That may be very helpful because Barry's going for $100,000. I'm going to feed you the question now. Okay. This is a famous civil war. Mm. What do you... Well, Brent? Yes. I know the battle. And as I recall it, both ships, uh, they fired away at each other and then they both left. One was very badly damaged and later sunk. But I think they both escaped the encounter with each other intact. So I, I think the answer is C. And I got to tell you, my confidence level on that is... Well, it's not 100%. It's, uh, it's a little, little north of 50%. I think both ships survived the encounter. Yeah. And one think, was later sunk. I was thinking, I was thinking both ships sank. Now you talk about that. I, I think that neither sunk at that point, but they sank, both sank later, I think. That's, so you, that, that could well be, but I think in that battle between the Monitor and the Merrimack, neither one sank the other. All right. Well, I think you... I think we're just going to go for that, and okay. you know, I, my wife may kill me. I think we're. I think I'm done. I think I'm going to try it, and we'll go see what happens. All right, Terry. Thank you very much. I want to remind you, Brent, that you thought it was both ships sank. Yep. Terry thinks neither ship sank. Big difference there. Big, you big have difference. Thirty-three seconds to make up your mind, Brent, for a hundred thousand dollars if you dare to go for it. Yeah. Starting okay. now. All right. Neither ship sank. Final answer. You thought both ships sank. I did. That wasn't right. Neither ship. Thanks, Terry. And welcome back to the New Brunswick Today Show. We're now joined by Mr. Brent Sonic Schmelz, the uh, Republican nominee for Congress right here in CD6. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, so uh, tell me just first of all about your background. How did you end up doing this stuff? And what, you know, uh, you're a Jersey guy originally? Yeah, originally from Westfield, New Jersey, where I went to, went to high school. Uh, I've always been interested in politics, how the process works, how people get elected, what they do for the country. You know, wrote extensively from my high school newspaper, also had a college newspaper that I ran, my first business. Very it's similar. have in common, yeah. Yeah, very similar. It's really great. Uh, and so I always wanted to be involved in that process, but I got involved in business first. Uh, went out, as I said, started a newspaper, worked in private equity, learned about companies, learned about how people work learned how people want to go out and hire others and drive, drive a living for themselves. Went to, when I went to Wharton, got my MBA, got my law degree, went back into business, ran companies, uh, started companies, understood the agony that a small business owner goes through, especially trying to run a startup in 2008-2009, uh, sure. which was you know, intensely difficult. Uh, Kept doing that. Then I went to work with my brother for the past several years at Soccer Post, and then we also bought City Sports, a chain of sporting goods stores, which was a lot of fun. Uh, since then, at that time running that, I realized, you know, I'm not really happy with the way the country's going, with what's happening in government, how they don't seem to be responsive, how it's a mess between both parties all the time. I said, I can either continue to be frustrated, or I can try to run and change it. So I decided to run this year. Right, and tell us. What do you hope to accomplish if you win? If you get, if you pull off this upset, you get to go to Washington, you get two years in office, what do you hope to get done? The places where I really want to focus are, are threefold. One is term limits. I think one of the biggest problems that we're having in our country is that people are so entrenched, they never get voted out of office, they stay there forever, and they don't have to respond to the constituents. I mean, it's really ridiculous. Almost 90% of the country is unhappy with Congress, but about 90% or plus of congressmen get reelected every year. There's a disconnect there. And part of it, what you pointed out in your intro, is, is the gerrymandering. Uh, and the only way to get through that 
is by forcing new people to enter Congress. And you need to do that with term limits. Uh, and to the gerrymandering, I, I think it's nonsense. I mean, we have, the way it should be driven right now is based purely on population splits, not on politics. We could just make an algorithm. So yeah, I think redistricting be, reform is a big... It's such a big deal. Yeah. Uh, and, but the easy part is you don't need to have this bipartisan committee to do it. Write an algorithm that takes a grid mm -hmm. and spreads the grid based on the population numbers that we have from the census, and you have your districts, and it's over. And then we'll get to see which way people vote. And it's some, some districts are Republican, some are Democrat, some will be a mix. We don't know until they're made. Uh, and I think those two issues would make a big deal. The other place I want to focus is around jobs and the economy. I go down Main Streets, you know, I'm a small business person, uh, and I see empty storefronts in every town in the district. You said you're from Metuchen. Metuchen has a, a Main Street. No, I'm not from Metuchen. Oh, you're not from <laughs> Metuchen, sorry. There's another kid. One of our staff members. One of our staff members, Metuchen. There's a ton of businesses and storefronts that are empty. That, yes, that are empty. And they're empty because it's so difficult for small businesses to survive in this marketplace. You have very strong competitive forces from the internet, pricing pressure, uh, and then you have government intrusion where it's just over-regulation from top to bottom, from local, county, state, and federal. Uh, if you can kind of clear that, clear that framework out, make it even, and then help businesses hire people, uh, provide a service to consumers, and provide vibrant main streets and downtowns, towns will improve. We'll have better jobs, more money flowing through the communities, and it'll solve a lot of the problems that we're having right now. Okay, so term limits, Jobs in the economy, and what's the third thing? That's that's the third thing, and I also, the other thing is just basic constituent service. I look at congressmen as being the advocates for their local community uh, in Washington. How do we make sure that they get served the right way? How are we bringing tax dollars back to the district? I mean, New Jersey is last in the country in return of tax dollars. Last, and it has been last for a very long time. Pete, fault of whose that fault is that is the congressman in New Jer in, uh, in Washington for New Jersey. So we have to go and fight for what we have paid in to get back. Uh, for example, uh, Fort Monmouth, that is local, Monmouth County, but lost 10,000 jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it's an incredibly, incredibly educated workforce, a lot of good jobs that left to go to Maryland. We can fall, they didn't all go away. It wasn't like there was a huge savings for the government in, in, uh, in, revenue, in expenses. But we lost, them. we lost that component to the economy pretty dramatically. Other places. When you are talk, when I'm out talking to people, people have little individual problems that they need help with. They need help navigating all of the agencies in government to get what they are get what they deserve. And the only way you can do that is by providing real support on the ground to constituents every day. Gotcha. Now, how are you going to pull this off? Because this would be uh, quite a feat to defeat the uh, incumbent congressman here. Uh, you know, what's, what's your plan? How's the campaign going? And, and how do you see this uh, shaking out in your favor? I think the campaign's going really well. Uh, I'm out there talking to people every day, up and down the district. Going door to door? Door to door, up in, from up in Piscataway in South Plainfield in the north, all the way down to Asbury Park in the south. Whether it's me knocking on doors, people that are working the campaign knocking doors, making phone calls. What we're finding is people are very frustrated. Frustrated with their lot in life, where they think, where the, in this district, it's a very... It's, a, it's an incredibly diverse district with a diverse range of uh, nationalities, immigrants, income levels. You, know, you have union members, you've got teachers and, and, and cops and firemen. You also have small business owners, you have people that commute to the city. Uh, a vast majority of them are just unhappy with what they're seeing happening in this country and the pace of progress in the world. Uh, they feel left behind many, much of the time. How do we focus on bringing them back to the fall? You know, the underemployment rate is mm -hmm. north of 15%, right? Which we talk about the unemployment rate going, going down. But it's not just the unemployment rate. Too many people are in jobs that aren't providing enough income for their families, uh, are underutilizing their skills and abilities, are, are making it more difficult for them to advance careers. Or they're having to work two part-time jobs, which don't provide the benefits that they want, or they're working as an Uber driver, which is employment, but you're just on your own. So. We have to focus on how to bring all those jobs back to the community to really drive home the economic strength and vitality of our region. Now, folks in New Jersey uh, are familiar with the Republican Party, and how are you going to overcome the negative reputation of Donald Trump and Chris Christie? 
both of whom are, are not really popular here. Donald Trump is actually on right next to your name on the ballot. Yep. Uh, and Chris Christie's been the governor here for quite some time and uh, is not very well liked by the people and, and has uh, you know a lot of his dirty laundry being aired out right now uh, in the Bridgegate trial. How are you going to overcome that? Uh, you know, do people uh, see the Republican Party as a damaged party, or are you somehow different than these other characters in the party? So, a couple of pieces. One, people out there in this district are, what the most important thing with all of the establishment, everyone that's out there, is people are just tired of the nonsense. And what I'm trying to put forth is a platform and a program that's pragmatic, that focuses on what people need, and doesn't, and just addresses people's issues. And by doing that, everyone I've talked to I get through and point out how I'm going to help them, how I'm going to be there for them, how I'm a different kind of candidate. I'm a business person, but I've, I'm a lawyer. I've been an educator. I know what it's like to be on the ground working with people every day. And that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm focusing on. And if I can do that every day, focus on that, on that message, I can get through and I can win. I've done that every day for the past six months or so. It's incredible. I mean, Frank has been there 28 years. It's amazing how many people don't even know who he is or when the election is. So by that education, by engaging, they appreciate it. And it's going to break through. Okay, so you're in business. You seem like you've been pretty successful with your business ventures. What do you think of Donald Trump's business uh, that he's done in New Jersey? I know a lot of folks in Atlantic City feel like he, he did them dirty. Uh, do you think Donald Trump is a good businessman? Are you going to vote for him? I think Donald Trump, Donald Trump is an interesting case. He is a... He has been a very successful businessman in a lot of ways. The issues with the tax returns just came up. We can be upset with this operating loss. What it shows is he took a lot of risk in his businesses, right? Um, risk is, isn't necessarily a bad thing in business. You have to take risk to move forward. Uh, and you get to take those losses, and government gives that as a benefit to taking the risk. Uh, are we unhappy with the tax, the way the tax code is written? Absolutely. You look at taxes, and we've got to completely overhaul the tax code. It can fill up. We're in a, in a small building here in New Brunswick. The tax code in paper can probably fill up the entire building and, uh, and still have extra spill on the street. Nobody knows it. Nobody can understand it. We should scrap the whole thing and start over from scratch because it's not serving us. You look at specifically in taxes, people spent over $10 billion last year on tax preparation. That's just a dead loss in the economy. Uh, if we can scrap that and move forward, we can actually make a difference. Okay. Are you going to vote for Trump? Right now, right now, Donald Trump is the is the candidate in, right ahead of me. I mean, when I'm, when I'm looking at the Supreme Court as a really important issue, Hillary Clinton uh, is a terrible candidate. Look, both candidates are incredibly disliked in this country, right? About seventy percent dislike both. Um, we're given really bad choices, and so the choices is is left up to everybody to make, and it's it's not great. Okay, so are you not endorsing uh, Trump? Or are you, 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 you going to vote for him? We have, neither, he hasn't endorsed me. I haven't endorsed him. Right? It's okay. one of those situations. But, you know, I'm just going to move forward. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm looking at this campaign as really vital, especially on the Supreme Court side. Okay, and so tell us a little more about that. You, um, uh, like, what issues matter to you that you think the Supreme Court might be weighing in on? Are there some big ones? So, on the, con on the Constitution, is the, when the Supreme Court... Um, determines what laws are going to be, uh, when, when they look at their cases. Uh, I view the Supreme Court as the whole type to the Constitution. The Constitution says what it says, and if we're unhappy with it, there's a process to change it. It's called the amendment process. We can't just change it willy-nilly because the uh, tone in the air decides that what this says should not be the case. Um, you look at issues like, uh, you look at actually the Bill of Rights. Five, four, four Amendments to the Bill of Rights have to do with the rights of the accused, right? And often, we play a little fast and loose with how to vote. I think you have to hold tight with that. The First Amendment issues, incredibly vital. They, the First Amendment is so important to how we all live as Americans. I think that um, when we think about the First Amendment, you have to understand there's also an obligation that goes along with that right to free speech, and that obligation is to be offended. You have an obligation to accept offense and discourse in public. And if you don't accept that, you're going to have an incredibly difficult time uh, with the First Amendment because we protect everybody. 
Uh, and those difficult comments, those offensive comments, are the ones that are specifically meant to be protected. Because everything else is easy. Okay. Um, uh, you didn't mention the Second Amendment. Where, where are you on like gun control? New Jersey has some of the stronger laws in uh, the country. So I'm, a, I'm, a you... support, I'm a supporter of the Second Amendment. I think that we have been given uh, a right to bear arms by the Constitution. It's been determined in Heller, actually, is the case. Uh, that gave individuals the right to bear arms. Guns are absolutely an issue in this country. I do support background checks. I do support closing all the loopholes in the online purchases and in the gun shows. I do support uh, limiting terrorists and uh, no fly, no buy lists with protections around, around due process so you can get your name removed uh, through an ex expedited process similar to a warrant process. So, uh, I think a lot of folks, at least in this area, are concerned about um, police use of force. Uh, you know, we've, our top story in our most recent issues, hundreds of people taking to the yeah. streets, marching uh, after a man was killed here in New Brunswick by police, and uh, the authorities, county prosecutors, still haven't even identified the officers that did this. Um, tell me, where do you fall? This has been a big issue. Do you support the Black Lives Matter movement? Do you, uh, uh, you know, where, where do you fall on this? So I, I look at it really I've paid attention to this very closely, and it's a really upsetting program pro problem that we're having out in the country. Uh, police are there to protect the individuals, protect the communities. And road if there's, when the cases where there's rogue police officers, they have to be taken care of and removed. Uh, however, we have to also understand that police are under an incredibly high level of pressure in their daily, daily work. Uh, they're in communities that do have high rates of crime. And we have to understand that there are problems that are going to happen. Um, I don't. I think that when there's an issue like a, a shooting anywhere, we should investigate that with the full force of law. That we shouldn't be protecting police that police officers that are uh, have committed crimes. We should, they should be prosecuted. Uh, but do you we see a federal role in that, or do you think it's okay to just leave it to the county prosecutor like they do? No, I I think that it, it's it's one of those things that goes up and down every level of government. It's local, county, state, and federal. We have issues. Now, there are limitations in what the federal government can do in going into state and local politics, uh, but there is a place. And part of that is, when it great comes down to it, a lot of these communities where a lot of these shootings happen uh, do have economic development problems, right? How do we help communities like New Brunswick have a better job base? When there's a stronger job base, we see crime go down. Uh, when there's better economic strength in a region, we see crime go down because people have the opportunity to provide for their families. And that's how we address this. It's all, ultimately, I look at it as an economic problem. Gotcha. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about New Brunswick. You know, what, uh, what do you love about New Brunswick? Do you have a connection to this town? What, uh, you know, what do you like about this place? New, New Brunswick has seen, uh, I've been in and out of New Brunswick for a long time. Uh, I've seen it come up uh, and really develop a, a culture. I, I enjoy New Brunswick when I come to it a lot. I love the diversity of it. Um, I love the culture. I think that you know the new the move medical centers has developed a tremendous uh, following, great service to the whole state, uh, and Rutgers obviously is is a key part of what we're doing here in New Brunswick. Uh, the new facilities that are in place are tremendous. I think Rutgers is doing some good outreach to the community and working within within the city to really bring uh, a community sense to the region. Um, new Brunswick New Brunswick is the center of the state. It's one of the it's and people look to New Brunswick. To, to a sense of what's going on in New Jersey. I mean, there's such vitality, such youth, such diversity. Uh, that's really a place that we should see it grow even more. Cool. Now, uh, here we have a huge population of immigrants. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of them are undocumented, and uh, there are some unique issues for those folks. Uh, for instance, you know, uh, not being able to get a driver's license, uh, things like that. Where do you s fall on the issue of immigrants' rights? Do you think... Uh, I, mean, I mean, do you think we need to build a wall and, and no. send people back? Or I mean, what, what, what do you see for this community here in New Brunswick that consists of so many undocumented folks? I, I, don't, I don't think we need to build a wall. Uh, I think a wall is an incredibly expensive proposition that wouldn't really have any effect on any immigration issues we have. Now, do we have to get a handle on immigration? Yes. Uh, can we deport 10 million people? No, we can't. So what is the process of trying to bring people out of the shadows? Uh, we need some sort of comprehensive immigration reform to deal with this problem. Um, I think it's not healthy for the country to have a huge number of undocumented immigrants who are 
living constantly, in some cases, living in fear. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to be very firm with them. I mean, you gotta, if you're going to stay, you got to come out, you got to pay the fine, and you go to the back of the line, and then we just got to figure out how to, how to deal with it. But it's not a case of mass deportation. That just doesn't work. Okay. Um, I, I looked at your platform. I noticed you said you want to uh, confront the opiate epidemic. Yep. Obviously, a big issue uh, in this election, uh, certainly in New Jersey, and certainly in CD6. Um, how exactly do you plan to confront it? What is your, uh, what do you see as the solution or, or, or things that you would support? I think number one with opiate and all drugs is that we cannot have a situation where simple use is dealt with in a criminal manner. It's a public health crisis before it's a, uh, a criminal issue. And if we can do that, we can bring users, as again, like the immigrants, bring them out of the shadows, allow them to get the help they need. Uh, we have, but by also allowing prescription drugs to be prescribed when needed, but not being abused so dramatically, because we are seeing it the uh, be overwhelmed right now in the system. And by the way, if you take it out of the criminal code and put it more into public health, you can also save a lot of money in imprisonment Absolutely. of, of nonviolent drug offenders. We incarcerate is, more people than any other country in the world. Yeah, by by factors, by multiple factors. Yeah. Um, so speaking of. Uh, Drugs, uh, you know, a lot of folks think that marijuana shouldn't be uh, illegal at all, shouldn't be a crime at all. Um, what's your position on that? Do you think, do you, do you support legalizing it at the federal level? So I think that we have to think about it very closely. And personally, I haven't done the research to understand whether we want to bring in full legalization where we put it in a bucket with tobacco and alcohol, which is what legalization would be. That'd be a really, really big step. I don't know if we're ready for that as a country. Uh, reduce are seeing some some uh, some good movement in Colorado and Washington. However, it should no longer be a Schedule One drug, and removing it as a Schedule Run Schedule One drug would allow states that have actually very specifically the VA uh, has because they operate under federal law cannot provide cannot prescribe marijuana in states where medical marijuana is legal. Um, sure. They push veterans who are dealing with serious pain and PTSD issues. And they actually tell them, go see this doctor, he'll help you get this prescription. By allowing it to be used in a prescription format within the VA, we can actually provide a lot of value to a lot of veterans. Gotcha. And uh, I'd like to talk about another drug, probably the most, most common drug, alcohol. Um, you know, do you see that as a problem here in CD6? I know you're uh, the vice president of the board of ed in Atlantic yes. Highlands, and you, you are responsible for an elementary school there. The elementary school is within 200 feet of the Carton Brewery. Yeah. Um, We've been great partners with them. Okay, so I, I noticed that, it, so you have worked things out with them? It's, yeah, they, it's come, okay. they come before the board every year. And it's uh, it's totally fine. They're one of the, a great business in town. They're a great partner. They understand the need to protect the students. They're not open during school hours. So it's fine. So it's fine, okay. And, and so they, you worked that out? Because I know it wasn't that an issue in, in August. They didn't come to the meeting. So they, they, yeah, they didn't come to the meeting, but then they, it's but it's been five years now, right? So in every year they get approved, so they came to the meeting, and so everything's going to work out. Okay. Now, um, I guess the uh, uh, oh, we have a question from from somebody on our, our uh, uh, Facebook stream. Uh, they want to know your position on campaign finance laws and campaign finance reform. Do you think there needs to be changes to those laws? I think there needs. I think there clearly needs to be changes. I think we're seeing a lot of dark money out there that should be out in the light. And now, there's two questions. One, should we limit donations? How do we work on that? Second is having donations that don't have transparency. And those are a very, very different issue. Uh, I think with Citizens United, what we're seeing is a lot of money where, where money from super PACs and other organizations can be used uh, to not directly invest in a candidate, but to state a view on an issue or a candidate. And that's where we're seeing a lot of the issues, right? Is all this kind of unaffiliated money. If that is where we're finding that a lot of people can uh, can push an issue in an election, that really changes the way that the people should be voting. And we have problems with that. And it's on both sides of the aisle. The Democrats and sure, sure. Republicans are both using it. I do think that we need to address that pretty dramatically. The question is how. Um, I don't have an answer on the how. Uh, but it's clearly an issue. So you, you agree there's a problem. Um, I didn't check, but I'd imagine you probably have not raised as much money as your oh, not even opponent. 
Um, where do you get your money from for your campaign? Who's who's been supporting it's mostly you? Mostly my friends. Yeah, mostly my friends. Um, I haven't received any PAC donations, mm -hmm. uh, and it's people that I know that trust me, regardless of whether they're Republican or Democrat, that want me to succeed because they know how good of a congressman I would be once in a day. Right now, this is a big healthcare. We call ourselves the healthcare city in New Brunswick. Healthcare, big business in New Jersey. Um, you know. Congressman Pallone obviously gets a lot of donations from folks in those uh, fields. Uh, if you were to win, uh, no doubt you would be, uh, you know, uh, in a position where where these companies would be coming to you, trying to influence legislation, uh, possibly giving you money if you're the incumbent to run again. Yeah. Where do you, you know, what do you think about the pharmaceutical business? Do you? think that it, it needs to be reined in. I mean, Johnson & Johnson is always getting sued for the way it marketed drugs or the, you know, defective uh, products they've had. Um, you know, do you think that the, the, the industry is a good thing for New Jersey, or do you think there's some problems that need to be addressed? And will you stand up to that big industry if you get in? Well, like, look at, like Frank Kwan has said, he, one of his biggest areas of donations is from the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry. Mylan, the EpiPen producer, has given him $10,000 over the past several years. Uh, we called him out on that. We said, look, return the money in this kind of situation. They're dr driving the price to unrealistic levels. And I, I actually take this personally. I have a niece who suffers from a debilitating allergies to food that she has had probably an EpiPen a year, every year of her life. And if, by having to buy those at that level, I believe we can afford it. But I know a lot of stupid people can. Uh, pharmaceutical industry, they're given a government-mandated monopoly when, when through the patent process. They do have an obligation to the country. Mm -hmm. uh, Congressmen have an obligation to, to deal with them carefully, especially when it's an item like, uh, like this, like the EpiPen. What, what, what is, they're increasing the price based on what? I mean, and then they go and lie to Congress around the amount of profit they're getting. Uh, and I'm not seeing Frank Malone do anything on that front. Uh, my view is I want everything transparent. Transparency solves a lot of our problems. By being very clear on what's going on, where the money's come from, what your views are, we can actually make a difference. And I would actually go to the pharmaceutical industry and talk, hey, these are issues to the people in my district. You know, yeah, you provide a lot of jobs to people, but you're also providing national service. How do we make sure that that service is provided as well as possible to the people of this country. And, and that really addresses health care more broadly as well. Uh, you know, the Obamacare, which Frank Malone said is an author, has been uh, good in some places, terrible in others. Over a third of the country's counties in the country now only have one uh, insurance provider on Obamacare, on the, on the exchanges. Another third have only two. Choice is being eliminated. Uh, premiums are going through the roof. Uh, making it very, deductibles are through the roof. It's very hard to actually pay for the health care. And it not, none of this is an, this is an insurance issue that we're dealing with. We're not even addressing the actual cost of health care, which is causing people to go bankrupt every year. And it's unreasonable. And we have to, we have to overhaul. Okay. Uh, a couple more topics I want to touch on. I know you are, you know, not only are you on the, the Board of Ed in, in uh, Atlantic Highlands, but you've also been a teacher. And uh, I wanted to ask how that... Uh, Experience informs your judgment and how you think that would help you be, uh, you know, serve in this role that you're trying out for, and you know what your views are on education and what needs to be changed or improved. It's obviously we can all agree education is important, mm -hmm. but um, you know the devil's in the details. What do you think? Uh, do you support some of these reforms that are going on now, like charter schools and uh, yes. you know park testing and, and all that kind of stuff? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of charter schools. Uh, I'm in favor of school choice. I think that we have to give parents the ability to drive the education of their students, very that of the of their children when they want to and how they want to. More oversight from from the federal government isn't really making our education system better on the ground. You know, on the board of ed, we get these mandates from the state, from the federal government that just cost us money, and it takes away from our ability to spend our our tax base on the education of the students. I mean, it's thousands and thousands of dollars a year. By returning more go local government, local control, I think we make education better on the local level. On the on the college level, I know the student debt is a huge issue right now for people. The best way to deal with the debt issue is by improving the economy. Why this is an issue over the past five years is because that cohort of peak graduates, 
between ages 22 or 21 and 28 or 30 are having an incredibly hard time getting jobs and have tremendously high levels of unemployment, upwards of 20% in some, some areas, but still have the debt and they still have to pay it. And you can't wipe it out with bankruptcy, which to me is a little crazy. Uh, we should be able to provide good, lower cost loans to students, but if we provide good jobs that allow them not to have to just work you know, at a McDonald's with a college degree, then the debt problem will take care of itself much more easily than just by paying for it. Gotcha. Now, uh, a lot of people think the biggest issue of our time is uh, climate change, the, uh, mm -hmm. the impacts that, that uh, the, uh, those changes are having on coastal mm -hmm. areas. Uh, much of your district is coastal yes. area. Uh, tell me, what, what, um, you know, what, what would you do differently than, than, say, Congressman Pallone if you were there to address these issues? Well, you look at you look at climate change, and um, I think climate change is real. And when we are as Good, me too. Okay, so let's just get that out of the way. Uh, but when you think about what people want, right? Uh, it's hard to see the effects of climate change directly. The focus is clean air, clean water, and clean earth. And if we can keep things clean, climate change will get better. Um, I do think we should be supporting uh, uh, alternative energies. Totally in favor of that. Uh, I don't. I think we should get rid of subsidies for fossil fuels, but I don't think we should get rid of fossil fuels. They're vital to the economy and they still drive 90% of our energy needs. Uh, however, within within climate change, driving efficiencies, making it easier for businesses to find efficiencies and develop new technologies that make our world a better place, will solve a lot of issues. Now, there's some big areas where there's emissions problems. Uh, you know, whether it's livestock. Methane, huge methane release from livestock. Uh, burning coal is a huge contributor to climate change, but you know it still provides over 30% of our power. Uh, natural gas is been is cheaper right now and cleaner than the other fossil fuels. So using more natural gas is a, is a good thing. So uh, is it fracking is a good thing. Or? I, I think that I'm not I'm not opposed to fracking, but I do think we need more transparency. We have to know as a people what is going into the earth. Uh, I think. If we have, without transparency of the chemical sludge that's going into the fracking hole, uh, it's really problematic. Mm -hmm. But it is an important, until we have viable alternatives, we have to continue searching for, for, nat for natural gas and oil. However, I, as I said, I would get rid of subsidies. Right. Okay. Um, and you, you touched on clean water. That's uh, the final question of the day. We want to, uh, you know, recap in New Brunswick, we've had lots of problems with the water. Uh, that we've been, you know, uh, given by the, the, the city. The city has uh, uh, had a, a water director commit suicide when he found out he was under federal investigation. We had a water treatment plant operator who's now in uh, state prison for mm -hmm. falsifying records and covering up uh, that we should have been boiling our water for several occasions and we weren't told. Uh, and just recently there's been additional violations. Uh, uh, what is it going to take to uh, fix this problem? Because it's it's obviously uh, you know not just the people in charge. There's problems with the infrastructure, right? So the uh, the, the water we're getting is going through old pipes that are uh, decaying, and, and lead is getting into the water in some of the schools. That was a story we uh, we broke in, in May. And uh, you know, if there's lead isn't the only contaminant, but there's just not. Um, not the money to reinvest and to upgrade this old infrastructure. I know Congressman Pallone has uh, put it out there that he, he wants to, to fund those types of things, especially for schools, uh, to replace old water fountains and old pipes. Um, do you think it's important? Is that something you're committed to doing, is, is, is funding this massive water. infrastructure project to, to make sure that people get clean drinking water? Or do you see, uh, you know, clean drinking water in every building being a thing of the past where... No, I think clean drinking water is one of those fundamental pieces that government can provide. I mean, I think Congressman Pallone has failed on this issue. I've been hearing about this from constituents in Perth Danboy who wash their lettuce with bottled water, right? They brush their teeth with bottled water. Because, similar to here, the water is just terrible. Uh, and I'm watching, watching Congressman Pallone focus on Flint. What is he doing? This is his district. He's got problems with water in New Brunswick, in Perth and Boy, in other places, and it's terrible. We have to work, and there's corruption, and you talk about, you talk about Middlesex County where it's the worst, 
it's actually a, a democratic uh, administration from top to bottom, a lot of corruption throughout that, that has caused this problem to be in place. And Pelona said, sit idle by. Lynch is some great press releases to say, oh, I'd love to do this. Get on the ground and work. Get people, out people who are doing the bad job. Tell them that you're going to out them. And make sure that they're doing a the job, that the water's clean, that the infrastructure is being replaced as, as needed. We should not have lead pipes in schools going to the fountains. We should not have uh, water treatment plants that don't filter the water properly. We should not have uh, sources of water that are contaminated unless we can very clearly and uh, clean them up in a real way. That's just, not a, that's just unacceptable. And it is exactly where government needs to spend time. And as congressman, that's what I would do. I focus on issues like that. When I say constituent services, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You have, I have a hammer. I'm, when you're in Capitol Hill, you have a hammer, right? You have a hammer that you can bear on local governments, on county governments, on the state. And I don't see Pallone using it, especially to his friends. You know, talk about Perth Amboy, New Brunswick. He doesn't come down on top of them. He says, oh, I, the Republican Congress is preventing me from bringing money to, to New Brunswick to take care of this issue. No, go deal with it. Get, it. get in your car, drive to an office, drive to the mayor, drive to the sewage authority, and say, we're fixing this, and we're not leaving this room, even to go to the bathroom, until it's fixed. Okay, so even if it takes billions of dollars, you are committed to investing in the infrastructure for water. Well, I don't think it's, well, one, I don't think it's going to take billions of dollars to fix New Jersey, right? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about this district. Do I think that it's a place where government should invest? Yes, government is in charge of infrastructure. That's what it is. That's one of the core pieces of action that government needs to take. It's making sure the infrastructure provides what it needs to to the people. And that allows for better economic development, better education, for people to live comfortable lives, and go about, go about their daily life in a good way. It's, you've got roads, you've got bridges, you have uh, water, you have sewer, you've got the grid. That's where government plays a role. The, one of the most important places it plays a role. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, last question, when's the deadline to register to vote? Uh, it's, a, it's October 18th. October 18th, everybody. If you're not registered, you've got to register three weeks before the election in order to be able to vote. Uh, CD6 is uh, kind of a snake-like district. It stretches all the way from the coast up to uh, here in New Brunswick. And uh, you can vote. Uh, on November the 8th, you'll have two choices on your ballot. Uh, our guest today, Mr. Sonic Schmeltz, thank you so much. And on Friday, you'll get to hear from Congressman Pallone right here on the New Brunswick Today Show. Thanks so much and good luck to you. Thank you very much. Great job.